Welcome to the IPX True North Podcast, where we connect people, processes, and tools. Today, we have Joseph Anderson, the president of IPX, and Neil Olivier, the director of corporate services at New Scale Power. And they're going to be discussing empowering ecosystem traceability within complex regulated industries. So my name is Neil Olivier. I'm the director of corporate services at New Scale Power. Um, under my department and corporate services, we're a large support organization for the entire new scale uh, company. Uh, we have records management, document control, uh, corrective action program, um, even facilities, and then a large engineering support subsection where we support the design control process and facilitate and administrate that program. And then also the largest contingent is our product lifecycle management. Um, department and they work closely with engineering support under design control and configuration management. So that's in a nutshell what corporate services does and those those groups are all under me. Thanks for joining us everyone. I'm Joseph Anderson, the president of IPX. Uh, I want to thank Neil and NewScale um, for giving us the time today and for joining us. Um, NewScale, if, if you don't know, is just a really, really exciting organization. Uh, revolutionary, actually evolutionary technology um, from a product perspective. Uh, and, and Neil, again, uh, it, it's my pleasure, it's my honor uh, to, to be able to do this podcast with you. Um, in your opinion, from your perspective, what makes New Scale unique? So what's different is that um, the New Scale reactor is a small modular reactor. It's the only one that has been certified by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, for deployment. And we got that in August of 2020. But what really makes it unique is that we're gonna build our, our uh, reactor in, uh, our in, in a factory. Um, so that'll increase quality control, shorten uh, construction schedules. And it's like nothing else in the nuclear uh, realm right now because most or all nuclear facilities are built and fabricated on site. Um, and not in a factory, which will help us tremendously lower the cost and um, shorten construction times. So from a, from a uniqueness perspective, um, just from a layman's term for our audience, that, that's basically meaning it's modular now, right? So you manufacture it all in-house, and then from a logistics perspective, it's, it's all about um, setup, right? And then maintenance and serviceability. So uh, it's it's not only just the manufacturing, but but now it's it's a, a mobility um, from a from a unique perspective, market perspective, and again layman's terms, um, that makes it more mobile. Correct. Well, it makes it um, a flexible design in that we we're not uh, we're not mobile, but what we will be doing is shipping um, by rail or by uh, truck. The mo each module to the site and installing it on site where in previous facilities uh, you fabricated most of it on site and we're changing that paradigm so where we're fabricating most of it in a quality controlled setting in a factory and then shipping to the site and it should drive down um, rework it should shorten all the construction times and lower the cost immensely because now you're producing them in a factory versus on site Got it. And from a from a quality perspective, a, a requirements perspective, what was your introduction, New Scale's introduction to IPX and CM2, and how do you think it applies to the design, the manufacturability, and, and even from a logistics perspective? What, you know, where did IPX and CM2 kind of come into um, your view? Well, and you know how we met. That was that it was happened to be three years ago at a Sim Data conference. Um, I was exploring what a PLM system was, and at that time, I had no idea. Um, I owned records management. I still facilitated design control, but I was looking for a new way to uh, to store records, and I needed a different system. And I had read a study on um, PLM, so we decided, me and a colleague decided to go to the CM or the Sim Data Conference. And if you remember, I was sitting next to you, you were on one side of me, my colleague was on the other, and we were discussing what was the right time to go to a closed loop change control process. And, and 
a more integrated across the board change control process. And when I say that, I mean across departments, not just engineering. And we started that conversation there and started a relationship between C, uh, IPX and New Scale. And so uh, that really was the start of it. And then I realized how much more we could, uh, efficiency and gains we could get from um, a CM2 perspective. And so that started us down that path of, you know, hey, we really need to dig into this more than just PLM because the PLM system really was a an answer to a problem I had with another records management system. And it, frankly, it led me to CM2. And then we started uh, that started taking CM2 courses at New Scale. So we got a bunch of people qualified to CM2C, which was great. And then that cross-functional group um, and, when, and I would say not only levels, but across different departments um, really led us into a working group while we were, uh, you know, installing or, or developing our PLM platform, a fully functional PLM platform. It, it really drove us to retool our entire change control process under this based on CM2. And so uh, right now it's focused on engineering but we're looking for um, gains and efficiency by going, you know, expanding that beyond um, engineering truly to get to an enterprise change control process so that you can, you know, use it for, you know, when we're fabricating facilities, things like that. So it's really right now, we just hit the tip of the iceberg with engineering. Yeah. And for the, for the audience, I absolutely do remember. I think that was just a setup question to make sure Neil remembered me and how we met. Um, but it was a great discussion, you know, and it's it's what a lot of our companies face um, or our clients or we like to call them partners is how do you get beyond engineering, you know, and beyond quality um, and, and honestly at an enterprise and into that beyond the four walls into that ecosystem. And Neil, the, the one thing that's fascinated me about New Scale is this is, again, it's evolutionary um, nuclear reactor design and um, what challenges has new scale and, and yourself experienced um, with the design with certification requirements around this new technology? Well, I'd have to say from a support perspective, um, it's the sheer amount of information that needs to be, whether it be documents, data um, or data sets that need to be managed and under configuration control. So while our design is, um, and I will, you know, say simpler, it's cleaner and, it, and it's smarter. It still has to meet all the same requirements that these gigantic plants have to meet. There's, uh, and I know just in one subsection in the regulatory area, I think we counted 60,000 requirements or something, you know, large, but all the information that backs that up needs to be managed. And up to this point, you know, before we went with a uh, CM2 based PLM system, it was being managed in various disparate databases. And so that's really been the sheer or the, the massive challenge is how do we get maintain configuration management control and then integrate all that information. So you get the right information to the right user at the right time. And unless you have a very well constructed and I would say data model, but like the way CM2 is, it lays it out where data sets are processed and they're attached inside PLM. It, it becomes very difficult. So that's the biggest challenge we face, at least from a support perspective, because I have to administer all those support functions within New Scale. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, that's one thing I, I, I think I've discussed it with you where a lot of, a lot of individuals and companies, um, and, and somewhat rightfully so, they define PLM as a system. You know, and if, if, if anyone's talked to me, PLM has been around a long time before quite honestly, desktop computers, you know, it's, it's about product lifecycle management from a methodology perspective, um, you know, and those, comp those complexities. And I, I don't know if a lot of people appreciate um, the nuclear sector and the requirements that are put on that industry. Um, and, and if you would expand upon um, just that complexity, how do you define those requirements? How do you manage, or, you know, what is your vision at New Scale for, definition, management, tracking, and actually associating those requirements to the actual product components and the systems. I mean, what, there's a lot of work there from just a requirement requirements management perspective. Watch that overall vision for new scale. 
So in the past, we have, and like other previous uh, nuclear entities, we we have documents that house all the requirements and it's all document based. And then those documents, then the requirements inside those documents flow down to say a system description. And then the, the requirements document or the system description ensures that you meet the requirements and then the engineer builds the system or designs the system based off of the system description and um, or system specification. And so what we're trying to, the vision we're moving to is whether it be a regulatory requirement or it be a customer requirement or a site specific requirement, that those requirements are at the, the top level or decomposed inside and traceable inside the PLM system down to the component. So I'll, get, I'll give you a good example. Um, is an, a, a power plant that's built in, say, Louisiana at sea level functions very differently than or, or has different systems than one that's in Denver at a high altitude. And just I'm and I'm not talking about inside the reactor. I'm talking about outside how you remove heat, things like that. Those requirements need to be um, inside PLM for those site specific designs for any type of um, variation. And they need to be de decomposed down to the part level as far as you can. And then they need to be validated up the other side of the system V until you can inside the system trace the, the validation that you met a requirement all the way back to its base requirement. And so there needs to be that full traceability that's easy and uh, to get to inside POM. So, and that, and that requirements, those requirements is what, the entire industry has struggled with keeping track and managing all those requirements because there's so many. Right. So from a, a simplistic standpoint, you know, to regurgitate that to the wider audience, there's a lot of options and variants, right. And in, in this industry, and I don't think a lot of people realize that when you start talking about environmental and site specific requirements, that's an options and variants. Um, and that kind of, you know, that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, that those have to be defined within the development process. So can you expand upon um, New Scale's current development process, maybe your vision for the future, how you're utilizing CM2 for managing the development process within the change process? Give us a little bit more insight where you can, um, kind of the complexity of that, managing all of that within a development process at New Scale. Well, it starts with requirements, and I was going to add on just a touch on what you said about the massive amount of requirements that have to be managed. Um, our industry, historically, if you, if you go back to the 60s when they designed the original or the first commercial power plant, nuke power plants, um, they designed them to a certain specification. The NRC bought off on that those design requirements. And then if you remember, we had, and this is just an example, we had um, a lot of, uh, you know, variation in those those power plants. They upgraded, they got much larger, and then people made modifications over time to make them more safe. We continually in the nuclear industry always add systems to make them more safe. If you discover a better way to do it, they'll retrofit old plants to make them more safe. Well, what wasn't truly in the past being managed was that the requirements that were approved by the NRC were they being uh, met with the as-built design? And so in the late 70s, early 80s, you had a point where you took a step back and you went, I've got this uh, as-built plant that has a lot of different systems in it that weren't in the original design. Does it still meet those design basis requirements? And it, it was tough to manage because you were there. It's all in document based. Imagine when, you know, the, back in the day, they backed up a truck of information, load of, of information to the uh, site and said, here you go, operator, you're going to manage it. And they'd have to connect all those dots at an engineering and an operations level manually. And so I remember um, this is just a few years ago when I was a control and supervisor at a power plant um, outside Philadelphia there, they had to replace a heat exchanger that got put in and, early 80s the company that made it is 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 not in business anymore so when we're in the control room i would have to bring those systems back online and i had an engineer who brought me a package for an, the safety related heat exchanger to bring it back online and he did his best to look through mountains of paperwork and different requirements 
and make sure that the new procured heat exchanger that he got met all those requirements. But there was no simple, hey, I'm gonna go in the PLM system and I'm gonna look at this part and I'm gonna trace back to every uh, requirement that it needs to meet to satisfy the safety case. He had to dig through mountains of paperwork and now it's just digital paperwork. They they say they've digitized, but it's really PDFs, right? And, and doing a, hopefully you can do a control F search and find the name of the heat exchanger you wanted. Well, I was responsible for signing on the dotted line that this thing could go back into service and I met all the safety cases. He was responsible for digging it all up. It took me 12 hours to dig through everything that he compiled, where if you had a PLM system that tracked all those requirements or in UCM2, to trace those requirements back to their highest level, it would it would take me an hour versus 12, right? At least. And I'd be sure, even I'm sure that we met all the safety requirements by putting that that heat exchanger. It was better than the one that was before. But on paper, it's hard to trace. And it all goes back to traceability of requirements. So hopefully I answered your question a little bit. Now going forward, what are we how are we doing things? Our goal is to to create that environment. So when I turn it over to the licensee or the operator, that I go, here's, the, here's all the information you need. So that operator on shift can go, okay, that piece of equipment broke. I can see every requirement it was supposed to meet. And I understand exactly what an engineer exa understands exactly all the functions and requirements it was supposed to meet so he can go procure another one. And that's really what the long-term vision is that we have that instant traceability that we turn that over. So with the traceability, um, you know, the expand a little bit about, upon the development process and the change process. What kind of um, communication protocols within your change process will you have with the external kind of regulatory authority? So now you have traceability, you have everything in a system or in systems, um, you have real-time analysis. We all know that um, nuclear is heavily regulated. Um, from a communication standpoint, how is this also going to improve um, the change process from a uh, review and approval outside of a new scale, right? So now we've got a design, we've got a maybe a site improvement or a new uh, component. What are you going to do um, within the change process um, from a communication standpoint throughout your ecosystem? So from that standpoint, that we can prove that it meets the regulatory requirements, we don't want to go change with the NRC because nothing is easy to change. Um, but what the system will do is any changes. So a, good, a better example than what we would change in the design would be like, so we meet 10 CFR 50 um, rules by implementing a quality program and really does our quality program support the design. Now they've bought, they've certified our design but we built it under NQA, ASME NQA1, right? So the real, the real, I would say, benefit to CM2 is when we see a change to a regulatory requirement and how does the outside ecosystem push in and we go, okay, now I see where everything touches. I know where this regulatory requirement um, hits in all of the pieces of the design. And that's really where we'll see the efficiency gains. Now, from a perspective of, uh, how will we change a design, our design change and how will we communicate it with others? That's where the CM2 process will really shine, especially with vendor suppliers and the operator owner is that we can see where one single change may drive to a customer requirement, or it may drive us to go ask for something in regulatory space, wherever, but we, that visibility and traceability is there. And that's really where we're driving to with CM2 is make sure that our requirements are completely traceable from top tier down to part. And if we can do that, then we've won 90% of the, or we've, we've solved 90% of the issues. Yeah. I, spot on. And I know I, I'm a nightmare for, um, you know, the approval teams within organizations and even my own team will tell you this for these podcasts. Cause I always typically go off the cuff with these types of questions, but I'm trying to, um, allow our audience to understand that um, this sector is extremely complex and, and you're not going to be able to gain all that uh, knowledge or the insight from a complexity standpoint just from this podcast. But for me, it's fascinating to think about from development into this regulatory, regulated industry, highly regulated industry. You're talking about 
in a nutshell, in the, in the simplistic form, creating and sustaining records. You're talking about creating and maintaining traceability. Um, from a new scale perspective, and you touched on it a little bit, what's that really truly mean in the future about when you, you hear people say going paperless and getting out, getting beyond PDF, which you and I have discussed and you brought up here, um, what's what's the future hold there? Um, will, will nuclear ever truly be out of uh, the paperless environment from a requirements perspective? Oh, I think so. Um, we're not there yet. Um, because there's certain, as you can imagine, most of the industry, 95% of the industry, they're still paper-based when it comes to managing records. Now, there's been some specific things around records when it comes to nuclear is that um, it may not be paper-based. And, and when I say paper-based, I mean actual paper this time. But when you talk about switching over to digital records, they're really talking about PDFs. And what the the thumb rule is I've got to be able to open up a record and in a file neutral format for like 50 from 50 years from now. And the, I think PDFA is the standard right now. What does that mean though for data? It gets much more difficult when it comes to data. So there will we truly always get away from uh, or get away from uh, records? I don't think so, but I think that record now is a rolled up um compilation of data so that it can be retrieved later no matter what system you're on and that's the key right it's got to be file neutral or it's got to be formatted in a, a neutral format so um like we what we've done so that we meet regular all regulatory requirements obviously is we've embedded some specific features in our plm system that every time a good requirement's a good example if the requirement is goes through its approval workflow at the end of it, it will roll all the pertinent information that, from a quality perspective up and turn it into a PDFA that is then stored in our records vault, our digital records vault. That meets those requirements, but allows us to drive to a more data centric approach at the same exact time. As, as our systems mature and as the industry now matures and gets toward a more data centric um, model, I guess, and process, we will we will mature with it, but we have to put the systems in place to make sure we meet all these legacy regulatory requirements and frankly, all the information records management requirements um, and the PLM system and CM2 does that for us. Right. It's it, it makes it very easy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, that kind of leads me to my last question, and I'm, I'm probably not going to phrase it correctly as far as how it was written for, for me to ask. Um, because I want to, I want to, you know, a bookend to this podcast is getting everyone to understand. Um, for me, uh, PLM is much more than just a system. And when you hear companies such as NewScale talking about the need for dynamic traceability, I'm, and we're talking very complex traceability um, from a design perspective, from a PLM system perspective. Um, for me, PLM, again, goes back to product lifecycle management. Um, I always like to say enterprise lifecycle management because PLM's well beyond just engineering product change. Um, Neil, what advice would you give to an organization, any size, um, that are implementing um, PLM and CM2? And why I say and CM2 um, is because I believe, again, if you look at PLM as a methodology, um, CM2 is PLM. Um, when you look at Dash 500, the standard, or the Dash 600 tool standard, to me, CM2 is the requirements for a PLM system to actually be a proper PLM or actually empower the product lifecycle methodology. So what advice would you give to an organization that's deploying CM2 and PLM? Well, my biggest advice would be to uh, get people qualified CM2C, and that sounds like I'm plugging this, but it, it the reality is you don't know what you don't know when it comes to a PLM system. And you're right, the CM2 process and that standard are the backbone for the software platform, the process in which you, um, you manage data. So while from my industry, there's some specific things we have to add to um, so for rip, to meet regulatory requirements, a couple more checks inside a workflow and things like that. The basis for all of it is CM2, and that allows you to 
manage data in a certain way uh, and be able to trace those requirements. If you don't have those people qualified CM2 before you start building out the system, you're in danger of driving a platform in a direction that isn't consistent with the vision you want to meet. So a good example would be is like my PLM developers that I have on staff, all of them have gone through some or all of the CM2C training. Um, and we have new people coming in and we're going to get them trained too. What I don't want is them sitting in with an engineer who needs a new process and needs access to certain data, or he's now introducing new data and not know where that, that goal and that end goal is and understand the CM2 process. Otherwise he'll build something in a silo over on the side and you'll end up reworking it later. And I think it just ends up being a much better product, a much better system and process from the beginning. You're going to have hiccups though. And this is the other thing that I would recommend um, say is that um, you are not going to get it all done. It's never going to be done. PLM never getting a system up and running. It's never, you're never going to go. I'm at the end of the rainbow and uh, I've PM PLM Nirvana it just isn't there. And I've, I've found that out painfully over the last three years that you, you can't get everything into the first phase. And I would say, do get your people trained in CM2 and then man, I would say start the project with a manageable set of things you want to accomplish and then plan to always improve. That's the biggest thing I can take away from this. We retooled our entire engineering support department to support PLM long-term. Um, and so we can always add functionality. Um, everybody, you, I have a, lo a line a mile long of different people in the, in the company that want to add functionality. And I never thought we would have that. We in our old system, it was very limited and there was um, there wasn't a very good attitude about the system because we didn't have that. We weren't didn't have the people or the resources in place to constantly improve. We do with the new system, but there's hiccups like everything else. Just plan for those and plan to have a lot of uh, uh, people who are educated in CM2 and understand your PLM system to add functionality. I think you'll succeed. Those are all uh, great points that many of I know you and I have talked about over the years, you know, and for me, it's, you know, for our audience, you know, to kind of summarize what Neil just said. And there was a lot of powerful statements there. Um, we've seen a lot of clients get it wrong. One, your system could could either empower good processes or they could speed up bad processes, which means you're just going to get data out the door faster. That's not correct, which means eventually you're going to have a quality uh, escape um, regardless of your industry. Um, the other one is, is manage things in phases and understand it's a continual process. And I've, I've uh, a big proponent of the word continual over continuous. Uh, um, continuous means you never monitor, you never stop. It's just continue, continuously going around. Continual means you have the correct phases, you monitor, and then you go again. Um, I like to say rolling top five, right? Uh, one of those rolling top five priorities that we need now. Um, and as you achieve a priority, you bump one up into the list. Um, but again, having digestible requirements and phases. Um, the nice thing you're hearing with um, from what Neil stated is the users want more now. And that's exactly the behavior you want to see. And that that is that is um, one of the leading indicators that your first go live of that system deployment was successful. Right, because you didn't give your users food poisoning. They they like what they're seeing. Now they want more, um, but you have to manage that um, in digest digestible chunks. Um, but now I want to say I know our time's coming coming up. I want to say thank you again um, to yourself personally for making the time, uh, but also to New Scale. And for those of you that that haven't heard anything about New Scale, um, I, I highly recommend you researching this company. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time discussing the technology. Um, it's fascinating. It, it really is. And I, I think it's the future when you're talking about uh, sustainable energy, um, you're talking about the future, the evolution of energy um, and production management. Um, this company's fascinating. This organization's fascinating um, from how it started to where it is today. So again, Neil, thank you for your time. New Scale, thank you for allowing Neil to participate. I hope we could have 
continual discussions, um, a few more podcasts if if I didn't mess things up too much with uh, going off the cuff with my questions. But again, thank you to the entire team. Um, and that's a wrap. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe and review the show. And for more information on IPX, visit IPXHQ.com.